you know, even to this day, I look back on that day and all I can think of is when they were wheeling my, my daughter out of, out of the house, down the hall, through the kitchen, they stopped so that I could see her and it looked like she was sleeping. The pastor was, you know, uh, saying the 23rd Psalm and I started to cry then and then she was gone. She was just gone, out the door, gone. Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce a wonderful woman who has lived in many, many places. She was born in Milwaukee and has lived in Colorado, Illinois, Montana, Arizona, and now resides in Arkansas. She's worked as a gas station attendant, done hospital work, nursing school, and has also worked as a paraprofessional in an autism classroom, which is where I met her because she was one of the paraprofessionals that helped my two boys and she is now a rancher but I just have to pause right there and say she is incredible and I'm so excited and honored to have her on today she has three children three stepchildren and nine grandchildren is married to the love of her life Steve for the last 15 years and in her spare time she knits crochets spend times with her horses and she reads Her passion is Jesus and serving the Lord. I am pleased to present Rebecca Christians. Rebecca, I know. Rebecca, are you ready to share your story of hope? I am. Awesome. So the reason I have Rebecca on the show today is she has a very unique story. When I first met Rebecca as an aide in uh, my kids' autism classrooms, I was so impressed with the joy she seemed to have. She was always smiling and happy. And it was only, you know, years or months later that I found out she had a daughter who committed suicide. And I was amazed that she could be so positive and happy and have had such a hard thing happen in her life. And so I knew as I started this podcast that she was one of the people that I wanted to interview and have her share this story of... um how how she was able to heal and how she's continuing to heal after dealing with suicide in her own family and in her home, own home. So this is a heavy topic, isn't it, Rebecca? <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> so why don't you start us off and, and tell us briefly where you were at and what your life looked like a little bit as you as uh, your daughter Autumn was struggling Well, we were living in Arkansas and, um, you know, it, 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 depression and anxiety and all of those things are so insidious. I knew that something was wrong, but I, I didn't know exactly what there weren't a lot of options in 2002 when all this was happening. I found out later that her, she had kept a journal and it got into the wrong hands at school was passed around and there was bullying that went on. Um, I think she was struggling also with um, with her uh, sexuality. Um, there was just a lot of things that, you know, some of it no one ever told me until way later after I'd already lost her. And I was working full time at the hospital, going to school. You know, I've I've talked before and, and what I've said is that, you know, I was an unintentional, ignorant parent that I just didn't recognize what I was looking at. I did get her counseling. I wanted to get her into a mental health hospital. They were full. Um, yeah, so I didn't, I wasn't able to do that. And then, you know, one day, I can remember the day before really vividly, 
Um, I had come home from work. I was super tired. Um, and she told me she loved me and I went to bed the next day I got up and I was, um, out of the house and I got a phone call from my oldest daughter who found her sister and she was hysterical. And I remember hanging up on her, turning around, coming back, being met with ambulances, police officers, um, a friend at the time had come over and gotten my other, gotten my son and my daughter and um, they wouldn't let me in the house. I was, I was confused. I was, you know, immediately in denial. And Autumn was a born again Christian. She had been baptized. She had accepted Jesus. You know, she's, and I think she struggled with some of that as well, but uh, my pastor showed up and I went running up to him and I grabbed him by the lapels of his jacket. And I said, please tell me Autumn's in heaven. And he told me he, he couldn't tell me that. And I'll never forget that moment. I'll never forget that moment. And, um, I, you know, I, I had to make all these immediate decisions. You know, the funeral home came and I was like, I, you know, <sighs> I just got here. I, I don't even know what you're telling me. Paramedics are saying, you know, can we do anything for you? We can't do anything for your daughter, but can we do something for you? And I'm like, what are you even talking about? You know, I, I don't understand. Where's my child? And what do you mean? Yeah, you're that, still processing all this. It's not, it's like a living in a dream almost, huh? Yeah, you kind of dissociate. And I just sat there and I couldn't even... I couldn't even cry because I couldn't even realize really what it just, what I was just, what just was going on, you know? And I, you know, even to this day, I look back on that day and all I can think of is when they were wheeling my, my daughter out of, out of the house, down the hall, through the kitchen, they stopped so that I could see her and it looked like she was sleeping the pastor was, you know, uh, saying the 23rd Psalm and I started to cry then. And then she was gone. She was just gone out the door, gone. And I was left sitting on the couch with all these other people who were, you know, crying and, and grieving. And I just thought, you know, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand what's going on. And, you know, my former pastor's wife called and, and told me how sorry she was. And I remember telling her, you know, the Lord could have stopped her. He could have reached right down and stopped this. And he didn't. And so I have to figure out what to do with this. I mean, even that day, I had to figure out what to do with this. What do I do with this? You know, and so that's kind of the day. <laughs> that was the day. That was the day my life it kind of ended. Oh, and, I can and only went, imagine. Yeah. I mean, I, I started a whole new season that I did not have a clue what you do with it at all. So it, it almost sounds like this was a day where so many questions were brought up in your mind, especially with regards to God. Why did God let her do this? Why did he let this happen? And, and starting to process that along with all the questions about her as well. One thing I learned in that day immediately was that um, I, my shoulders were not big enough to carry this. I can't ask why. The Lord knows why this happened. He knows why he didn't stop it. He knows what he's doing. I have to trust in that. Just, you know, I, I don't like to use the word blind faith. But almost blindly, I have to go in and and just trust that he knows what he's doing and that I may not know for a really long time, if ever, and his shoulders are just bigger. I cannot carry this burden. Oh, no. So I, I never really, I don't, I never really asked why. The only question after the service and we had a viewing, which was weird 
I mean, I, again, it was like I was standing outside of my body. People started to come in. They would hesitate to me. I already didn't want to talk to anybody. And I would show them Autumn in the casket, which was just hard take. And, um, you know, it was exhausting. And then the next day at her service, I sang in the garden. It was one of her favorite songs. And I sang and I, I, it was totally a Holy Ghost moment because I couldn't do it. I could not have done that on my own steam ever. And um, it was just, I just constantly remember clinging to the Lord and going, you have to carry me through this. You just have to carry me through this. And the only question I think that I had that I asked the Lord, in fact, this is the only question after everyone had left and gone home and traveled back to their states and whatever, I was in the shower and I just just started to bawl. I was just racked. And I said, Lord, I'm going to do something that I've never done. I'm going to put out a fleece. I need to know that you have my child. I need to know definitively, without a doubt, without question, that Autumn is sitting at the feet of Jesus. and. I was done with the prayer and I, a, a huge wave of calm came over me and there was a ring that I wanted Autumn to wear for the viewing that her best friend in Arizona had given her that matched a pair of earrings. The ring had been broken and she didn't wear it mm-hmm. and I could not find that ring. I ransacked her drawers, her jewelry box, everything and could not find it. And I had asked the Lord for a sign and he you know, I was prompted to go look in her jewelry box, which, of course, I'm like, I already did that. I even had other people look at it. Mm-hmm. Well, I opened the third drawer of her little jewelry box and there was that ring. Mm-hmm. And I, Tamara, it was not there. It was not there. Mm-hmm. And it was, that was broken. But when I went to look after being prompted, there it was. Oh, man. And it was broken. And that's why she didn't wear it. Mm-hmm. When I found the ring after being prompted, the ring was not broken. Now you tell me. (laughs) If the Lord didn't deliver a great big confirmation right then and there in a grieving mother's heart, I don't know what confirmation looks like. Yeah. Oh, Becca, that is the sweetest story. And I love that you were a that you were able to just talk to the Lord and tell him exactly what you needed, because that was what you needed more than anything. It's just exactly. to know that God had her. Yep. Yep. You know, I just needed to know that she was safe. She was whole. She wasn't struggling. She didn't have to be hopeless anymore. She didn't have to be bullied. I just needed my child safe. And he delivered big time. You know, just delivered big time. So, um, you know, then from there, I was like, okay. Now what do I do? Yeah. So so now what did you do? I know this next period of your life was extremely difficult. How do you pick up from something like that and move forward? What did that look like? How how did you even do that? You know, I'll be really honest. For about for a long time I just didn't participate. I I couldn't go to that end of my house. I couldn't uh I, I couldn't finish nursing school. I tried. It was abysmal, so I just dropped out. Um, I tried to go back to work. I couldn't work. Um, I was. Uh, I didn't go to counseling, but about six months after Autumn passed away, I was at work, and I went down to lunch, and I began to cry. Oh. And I cried and cried, and I thought, oh, I can't sit here. And I went back up to my nursing unit, went into the break room, continued to cry. The charge nurse came in, and she said, what's wrong? Are you okay? And I told her I couldn't stop crying. I had a complete breakdown. I ended up being hospitalized on my unit for for a week and then transferred to the same mental health facility I could not get my daughter in. Oh, wow. And I... It's kind of foggy how long I was there. I feel like I was there about a month. Um, And it actually, uh, it was probably a good place for me at the moment. Um, But uh, then I went to a psychiatrist after that. And, 
you know, I just, I try, I was on a ton of medication. So I was kind of like a zombie. I mean, I stopped parenting. I stopped, um, stopped doing all the, all the things. And then, um, I was at Harps and this is how I reconnected with my husband. We'd already known each other for eight years prior to this. And, um, I saw him at the Harps. I finally had to go get some groceries for my poor son. And Steve was standing at the end of the aisle and I looked awful. I hadn't showered in a week. I had a ball cap over my head. I had gained an enormous amount of weight because of the medication and I was in dirty clothes. I mean, I was completely the saddest looking stray dog you ever saw. And he, he saw me and I tried to hide from him and went to a different aisle and he waited at the end of that aisle. So I couldn't get away from him. (laughs) And so, um, when I finished checking out, I looked at him and he said, hi, and went to give me a hug and I just fell right into him. And we started dating after that. (laughs) And then we got married about five months later. There you go. But God sent him to pull me out of the blackness because no matter, I journaled and journaled and journaled and my journaling were prayers and conversations to Jesus. And, and I would always end with, please give my autumn a hug and a kiss for me and tell her I miss her. You know, I think what's so overwhelming about the loss to someone of by suicide is that they lost all hope. They made that choice and you're never, you never got to say goodbye and you're never going to see him again. And it's hard to reconcile all those things. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I I can only imagine. But I think that confirmation you got probably gave you just a little glimmer of hope that you will see her again. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, and that was the thing. I knew I was going to see her again, but in the meantime, I'm left behind. Yes. But, But my hope was always there. I mean, I never, I never lost hope that A, I would see her again, that B, God was going to do something with this, that C, he was going to tell me what to do with this. Because at her memorial service, I had made a promise. I made a vow, a solemn vow to everybody that was there that I was going to, you know, find something that would bring glory to the Lord and honor Autumn that this would not be for nothing, that she did not die for nothing. And, um, you know, I had to have, you know, I had to lean into the Lord for that. I mean, I, all those letters to Jesus, I mean, they were just long and tormenting, but he met me on those pages all the time. And there were more, many nights, even through, um, I have PTSD and even through the nightmares, Jesus would meet me in the morning and say, I've got you. I have you. We, we are going to do this together. Yeah. That is so incredible. I'm so glad. I, I too have found a lot of healing through journaling and I don't know what it is about writing it all out, but it's powerful. And, um, yeah. and I love how you said that God will meet you on those pages. And it is while we're dumping our soul out and writing our fears and our nightmares and um, just getting it all out that he does come and just slowly starts that healing process. But it's only as we kind of lean on him. I love that. Lean into him. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, you really have to, and leaning and pressing, I mean, you've got to, I needed to really feel his presence. I mean, I almost had to manifest, you know, the whole I would hold my Bible to my heart and I literally could feel him as I pressed that to my chest. And same with the journaling. It's a purging of, of the dark things that he wants us, he wants to rescue us from. I mean, and he wants to heal us from, he's the ultimate healer. He may bring you people that assist you in that healing, but ultimately without him, you're going to just swirl the drain. You just are. Yeah. I love that. Oh, that's so, so perfect. So you began this process of healing and it wasn't quick, was it? (laughs) No, years and years and years. 
by the time I got my job in the autism classroom, I was still broken. That was at year three after Autumn had passed away. And if it wasn't, you know, I found a lot of healing in those precious kiddos that would come to class every day. And you're Jacob. Oh, my goodness. I love Nathan. But your Jacob would curl up in my lap. Uh-huh. And he was my little ginger snap. I yes. just loved him. Yeah. I loved chasing him. I oh, love he gave me joy. <laughs> and he showed me in all of his innocence that Christ does amazing things, mm-hmm. you know? And I, and, and bless you, I know I didn't live with him. <laughs> I got the fun <laughs> part of, of the kids. But I mean, those days were precious. And even to the point, even when I got to the point where, you know, I, I had to leave the autism classroom. God had finally showed me what I was supposed to do. But all those years of working with those kids and meeting the moms, meeting you and working with the teachers that I worked with, they were all prep for what God was fixing to call me to do. And, um, I can tell you about that day if you want. (laughs) Yes. I actually was just going to say, tell us about this new calling that, uh, kind of furthered you on that cause, and and maybe that's that's the way God helped you fulfill your vow. I, I want to hear this yeah. end of the story. So so go ahead, tell it to us. Yeah, it was it was amazing, and it was you know funny, and it also shows you how human nature will just balk at anything. I was I was off that day, and I thought a lady at church had given me this CD of an interview with a lady in Oregon, uh-huh. and it was she said when she it was from Folks on the Family, and she said when she heard it, she just thought of me and blah blah blah, and I thought, oh, you're such a sweet lady. Okay, fine. You know, like when you give somebody a book or somebody gives you a book and says this is a great book, you got to read it, and you're like. Oh, thanks. Great. Yay. And it goes on the shelf. <laughs> it goes on the shelf. Amen. That's exactly right. So I thought, oh my gosh, this is Wednesday or Thursday. I need to listen to this because I've got to give this back to this lady at church on Sunday. So I thought, okay, I'll throw it in the CD player and I'll dust the living room. <laughs> so I, I slammed it in there and pressed play and started dusting. And within five minutes, I was sitting on my couch bawling and literally, I, and it's so corny, I heard the hallelujah chorus in my head and I, that was what God was calling me to do. What this lady does in Oregon, she's, um, she started Crystal Peaks Youth Ranch and she took rescued horses. She rescued these two horses. They started a ranch quite by happenstance. Mm -hmm. It was God, but quite by happenstance, if you're, you know, on the outside looking in kind of, and, um, they started this youth ranch where they rescue horses and pair them with kids in their community that are at risk, special needs kids, kids that are in trouble with the law, kids that have depression, who are suicidal, who have a myriad of mental health and behavior issues. And right then and there, within five minutes, I knew that's what I was supposed to do. That was it. And of course, I said, no. I'm not doing that. (laughs) Girl, when you told that story, I totally got goosebumps. (laughs) You know, what are you thinking, Lord? (laughs) Oh, I know, right? (laughs) And he said, gotcha. (laughs) (laughs) That's how we know he has a sense of humor, right? (laughs) So I, I, I told my husband and he was like, oh, we're in so much trouble right now. This was not my poor husband's calling, but it was definitely mine. I went to church. I gave back the CD of the interview. And and mind you, I never finished listening to the interview. (laughs) And I told the congregation what I had been called to do and that they had information clinics out there. And the next one was like in a month. And I needed X amount of dollars to go And the next day on Monday, two people, precious couple from my church brought over an envelope that had all but $110 of what I needed to go. Oh, my Lord. Yep. Can't convince me that it wasn't the Lord. (laughs) And I went and, and mind you still, I was still a broken person. I still was afraid of my own shadow. I still had a ton of anxiety issues. And I really... I really thought this was a 
you know, how am I going to do this? And I found out at that information clinic that if, if God calls you, he will equip you. Um, years later, a friend of mine that I met through Crystal Peaks gave me a ring, which I wear today. And it says, you can't even hardly read the inscription on it anymore because it's so worn, but it says, if God calls you to it, he will bring you through it. Ooh. And Power. I lean on that every day that, and if God calls you, he will equip you. You know, when we were talking earlier, if you were good at something, he wouldn't get, he made you good at that. He's not going to call you to do that. Mm, True. True that. He always gives you something that will stretch you and make you grow. (laughs) Yes. Stretch you, make you grow. And in the end, bring him glory Yeah, because I can only give him all the glory for this. You know, running a nonprofit is, is, fun and exhausting and being in ministry is fun and exhilarating and exhausting. And sometimes it's, you know, brings you to your knees. It's humbling. It's healing. So in 2009, after seven years of praying, the Lord breathed into being Autumn's Rewrite Youth Ranch. And um, it's been a crazy ride ever since this is our 10th year Mm. and I'm just in awe we have grown exponentially and I look out today at the difference in the in the past year we have 19 horses four sheep and I don't know how many chickens (laughs) and the children that come through I hear Autumn's voice I see her face but more importantly I see the hope of Christ Mm mm-hmm And I'm able to give that. Now, having said that, Mm -hmm. you know, healing is an interesting thing. And seasons of your life are interesting, too, um, because I came to a point where after 10 years of doing this and I realized I'm the last two years, I'm really depressed. (laughs) I'm really struggling. I'm having trouble putting things where they need to be, Um, you know, and there's a lot of triggers that cause that, you know, my PTSD has never gone away. I don't think these things ever go away. You don't ever heal from these things. I don't believe, I believe they just get different. And so I'm at a point where I have a another new normal that I'm just started a couple weeks ago. Right. And and I I love the way you're open and honest about this because healing does maybe come in phases perhaps would be a good way of saying it where you yeah. reach a plateau and then you kind of need to do some more healing and it sounds like you've reached that point again and I'm glad you're talking about it because I'm sure there's others struggling out there who may have reached another point where they need help and healing. So what do you do then, Rebecca? Well, you know, I my prayer life was starting to suffer and I wasn't hearing the Lord as I had heard him so clearly, you know, speaking through scripture and that kind of thing. And I thought, oh my gosh, I need professional help. I went back on medication uh, about a year ago Mm -hmm. and because I thought I'm going to, I'm not, I'm not right. You know, you have to listen to your body and especially after being through such something so traumatic, anything traumatic, be it a car wreck, be it um, guys on the battlefield, regardless, Mm -hmm. you know, these these aren't weaknesses. These are broken things. Yeah. And I had to go, I had to reach out and go back into counseling. And I, I was in awe that I had reached that point again, where not that I needed to be hospitalized again. I mean, I'm not there, but I'm at the point where I'm, I can't, I can't function in the world. I got to where I didn't want to leave the house again. Um, And I always struggle with that a little bit because the ranch is my safe place. I provide a safe place for others, but it's also my safe place. And I was having struggles with, um, you know, 
interpersonal relationships, just conversations. I mean, my husband was like, boy, you're grumpy. And I'm like, I'm not grumpy. (laughs) But, you know, and it's so when, when depression and anxiety grows over time, it's real insidious. And yes, the Lord can heal that in a boom. I believe that. However, I also believe that he brings you people to help you with these things. Yes. And in all honesty, Tamara, I fluctuate between praying that the Lord takes all this away from me so I can be quote unquote normal and don't take it away from me so I can be compassionate and understanding. Yeah. Oh, that you know, is powerful. It, yeah. So, ah, uh, it's kind of crazy, but I'm on, I, you know, next week will be week three of therapy. <laughs> Good for you. And, and well, and so far I've spent, it's an hour long session each time and I ball through the whole thing and it's video. I, I do it through Teladoc. It's amazing. And I found a wonderful counselor that way. And she's at this point, I think we're just unpacking all the junk. Mm. And it's amazing to me to find out all the things that I thought I had dealt with, but never really faced. Mm. Um, And so my hope is being built up again. Good. I never lost it. All. You know, I, I want to be clear. I never lost hope, uh-huh. but I, but it was different. And now it's becoming bolder again. I mean, as we go through th- therapy, it'll be bolder and bolder and bolder. And um, I had a dear friend say that she was, and this is difficult to repeat, but she said, I'm really proud of you. That's very brave. And I don't feel brave. I feel like I just needed to make the right decision for me. And I encourage anybody and always have to go into therapy if that's what they need. You know, if you feel you need an outside person to talk to, man, go. You know, there is nothing. That's why God gave these people the ability to do this job. Yeah. You know, you said that you found your doctor through Teladoc. How, how do how did you how were you able to do that? It was through my insurance. I have um, an Arkansas company, and I don't know if it's called Ambetter, and I don't know if everybody can get that, but they sent me this email, and it was really funny because, again, God is so timely, <laughs> and I, because I knew I needed to go to a counselor, but I thought, oh my gosh, I can't see myself going and sitting in some dude's office and having them look at me with that look and saying, so tell me about your day. Look, I don't want that. I I want, you know, I I don't want to tell you about my day. My day is fine. It's my life that's broken. Let's go there. You know. Oh, you're so cute. You know, it was in a neat email and I looked at it and I, it said behavioral health. And I thought, oh, I need behavioral health. <laughs> and I looked at it and I read all the things and I I asked for an appointment and boom, there it was. Had my first counseling session two weeks ago and it was amazing. And so you're able to do all this from the comfort of your safe place. Yes, in my jammies if I want. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> yes. So this is so cool that mental health has come to this point where you can um, do counseling sessions over the internet. What an incredible thing. Oh, it is. It is because there's a lot of folks that struggle with the same thing. You know, I don't want to go to some guy's office. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want everybody to know that I'm dry. What if somebody drives by and sees my car or, you know, the things that we tell ourselves, there's a lot of self-talk that's so defeating when we need help, you know, and I think that there is no crime, no sin and no, um, There should be no embarrassment in asking for that help. Self-care in any situation, be it dealing with kids that are hard on the spectrum, dealing with the loss of someone to cancer, the loss of someone to suicide, job stressors, you know, any of those things can trigger us to come to a place where we need to reach out for a human helper along with our spiritual, you know, helper, our, our Jesus, you know. I don't think that there's anything wrong with putting those two things together. And I don't think that just because um, 
I've had people say really crazy religious, quote unquote, religious things to me like, um, you're depressed because of some unresolved sin in your life. Wait, what? Wait a minute. I, you know, I, I can't wrap my head around that. So no, zip, that's gone. Okay, so and, that's something not to say to people. <laughs> yeah, it's not because of that. You know, the reason you're depressed is because the chemicals in your brain are broken. <laughs> you know, you don't have enough melatonin. You don't have, I mean, there's a science behind this. There is. You know, and it's very important to pay attention to the science behind it. It doesn't mean you're a lesser person. It means that some of your chemicals aren't working like they're supposed to, or they've, because of trauma, they're gone Mm -hmm. and they're not being produced. And so you need maybe medication. That was a hard one for me to realize I had to be on medication for the rest of my life. Um. It's just not why the Lord gives us life to glorify him and he wants us to be happy in that. Yes, he does. So why are we fighting against medication and counseling and all these things, you know, when they're clearly there, Yeah. you know, God made these people compassionate. He made the guy who developed the medication just be careful with it, you know? Yeah. Be prayerful about it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Very good. Wow. This is awesome. I love I love all these nuggets that you're sharing with us so far about I love the self-care. Oh my goodness, that's so important. And I found that to be important as I was dealing with my kids on the autism spectrum too, that I needed to take care of myself so I could then take care of others. And that's what you do for your job. You help others heal, but it's important that you take care of yourself so that you can do that job well. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. That is really, really great. So you have shared several lessons about how God's shoulders are way bigger and stronger than yours. And, and he is the person that you need to lean on. Um, the importance of uh, watching for those people God sends your way to help you, whether it be um, friends or spouse, um, mm-hmm. and also looking and getting the the physical help you need from your doctor, the mental health you need from your counselor. So these are angels God sends along the way to answer our prayers, right? Yes, I absolutely, absolutely agree. Yes. The power of journaling, the power of prayer and listening, um, and just being sensitive to your body as you go through these phases of healing, right? I, I think yes. that's important. It's super important. You're not going to heal in a week, a month, a year. I mean, I believe I I try never to count, but sometimes I have to. And I believe Autumn has been gone 17 years, which means she's been gone now longer than she was alive, which was really hard to process. But my healing and my grieving has gone on all those 17 years from moment one. I mean, you can't limit yourself to how long it takes you to grieve. But what you do need to do is pay attention to how you're processing that grief. Are you in trouble? You know, is your grief so deep that you're not moving into that place that's different because you can get stuck to where you never move again. And I really want to encourage people to, to find out, find that place that's different, that's manageable, that's livable. I mean, I can find joy again and it's okay to have joy. I had to tell, I had to give myself permission to smile and laugh. Mm. You know, I mean, that's, it's okay. The Lord gave you those muscles, man. Use them. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, girl, that is, that's like a quote I'm going to paste on my bulletin board. (laughs) (laughs) That is awesome. And I love that you gave yourself permission that even though you had this really hard thing in your life, you said, I can still be happy. Yeah. I can still have joy. And, and God does want us to have joy and be happy. And so he'll help us reach that point. Yes. Those are his, those are his gifts. They are. They are. 
So were there any uh, Bible verses that became particularly meaningful to you? Jeez, yeah. I mean, all of, almost all the Psalms. I mean, I must have lived in the Psalms forever. But one of the first ones was Isaiah forty thirty one, and I'm sure everybody knows this. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not grow faint. And that was a big one because I. I felt pretty faint. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and I felt so weary and I would close my eyes and I would play a movie of Isaiah 4031 in in my mind. Um, And I would see myself rise up on those wings that the Lord was giving me. And I just, I, I really held fast to that to that scripture verse, like a lot of people do. I mean, there's your strength, your courage, your bravery, your hope. It says so many things to me. I mean, you can pull out all kinds of tidbits in that one chapter without, you know, interpreting anything. I I was waiting on the Lord. I was waiting seven years for him to tell me. And he renewed my strength during all of that time. Oh. He allowed me to mount up on those wings. Mm-hmm. You know, I started running. I didn't get tired. I walked. I didn't fall down or grow faint. I mean, each day was like an Isaiah forty thirty one. <laughs> I love that you visualized it. You know, they're yeah. they're discovering now the power of visualization, and 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 I can see that that probably helped you through the healing process. You visualized yourself. God strengthening you and giving you the power to be like an eagle and be strong and soar above your problems. And I can see how that would be a powerful visual image to think of every day. Wow. Oh, yeah, it was. I mean, and I had to, you know, it took a while. I mean, it wasn't like the first time I read it, I was flying around the room, you know, but <laughs> it was... <laughs> It, baby it, steps, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And I encourage people, you know, take those small steps. Uh, it's okay, you know, but now I've got a great big eagle. And, you know, again, I had to I had to recognize I was in trouble. And uh, again, I go back to Isaiah 40, 31. And then Psalm 91. I mean, it's it's read it to us. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall be no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet, because he hath set his love upon me. Therefore, I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. You know, this is this goes right along with, you know, Isaiah forty thirty one. Yes, it does. You know, he that dwelleth in the secret place. I have a secret place. You know, we all should have a secret place. <laughs> excuse me 
um, the Lord is my refuge and fortress. I, I do trust in him. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I can see myself, you know, in an old English castle, you know, not Windsor or anything, but, you know, like a small one. And just right for me in the Lord. And that's my fortress. That's where I'm going to go. And he will cover me with his feathers. And under those eagle's wings, I'm going to trust. Truth shall be thy shield and buckler. There you go. I mean, this, again, there are so many nuggets. Mm -hmm. I love the angels part. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Isn't that beautiful? It is. I mean, and, and and I read the King James Version, which sometimes is kind of hard to decipher, but it's just, it's it's so beautiful. It is. I just love it. I could, like I said, I could just spend forever in the Psalms. And then the last one is a more recent one. Yeah. Share it with and us. And it's, it's like me now. It's to remind me. And it's Philemon 1-7. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Mm. And, you know, I have to remind myself, you know, there are those around me that refresh me. My counselor is a refresher. And, you know, there are people around me that love me and give me joy. And encouragement. And Jesus is my brother. Mm -hmm. And he gives me the ultimate love, the ultimate joy, the ultimate encouragement. I was charged by my um, counselor this week to write a letter to myself, but it's from Jesus. And I haven't done it yet because I'm, I'm, I'm struggling because it's like I have to see myself as Jesus sees me. And I don't see that, but I have to, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to sit down and I, cause I got to have it's due Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you love that, that they're pushing you to do these things and to see yourself from his perspective. And Rebecca, I'm telling you, God looks on you and I know that he sees the good in you. He sees the good that you can do and that you are doing. And isn't it amazing that God takes broken people like you and like me Mm -hmm. to share his love? Oh, gosh, yeah. And so, you know, he sees that you have this hope despite all the hard things that you've been through. And he says... That one right there, she is going to share my love and, and he sees your courage and your faith. And so I, I, uh, you keep writing that letter, girl. (laughs) Oh gosh, I got it. You know, so far I've got dear Rebecca. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm sure the first thing he would tell you is that he loves you. Yes. And I agree with you. You know, when we step out of ourselves and we step out of the the self-talk nonsense, you know, we can truly see how the Lord sees us, how Jesus sees us, how he meets us, how he walks with us, how he carries us. You know, there is no greater hope than that. There is no greater love and there's no greater excitement and joy to me, you know. So you just got to keep plugging on. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, my goodness. So what are some resources that you would point people towards um, either online or something like that where they can go to get help if they've been in a situation like yours where they've had a child or a close family member commit suicide? Um or anything like that, what would you recommend? You know, I think one of the things that I did was to get super involved in um, the Out of the Darkness Walk that they do here in Bentonville, Arkansas. And they do these all over the country. Actually, I think they actually do this worldwide. And it's through the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. And um one of the things that you can do is you can call up some you can call up the crisis line or the hotline and they get in touch with someone in your area who then can get you in touch with a volunteer 
volunteer uh, worker who can sit and listen to you. You can do it via video chat. You can do it um, on the phone. They can come and visit. And what their job is, is to listen. And their job is to encourage and reassure. Um, We have, you know, through the agency, there's a multitude of resources um, that we can give you, uh, you know, and you can look it up on Facebook, you can, you know, Google it online, um, out of the darkness, and that'll, that'll take you to a whole bunch of places. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll put this in the show notes. The, the website for that is afsp.org. And, yeah. and like Rebecca said, it's a fantastic resource. So that is that is incredible. And it's neat that they can put you in touch with local people that can also become your angels, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, my gosh, yes. In fact, you know, I a side note, when I started to struggle like this, the first person that I notified was my friend who is the chair for the Out of the Darkness Walk here in Bentonville. And I said, Marcy, I'm struggling. I need a counselor. (laughs) And she gave me a list of people. And as it turned out, the teledoc worked for me better than the list of people was going to. But I mean, she was right on it. And she was at work. So I mean, you'll get a rapid response. That is awesome. And that's good because I, these are people that, that know what they're doing and they deal with this all the time. So yeah. Or, and they've been through it. Yes. There you go. Oh, fantastic. This is incredible. Um, What final tips would you like to share uh, for people that might be struggling, um, going through a hard time right now, whether it's because someone has committed suicide or just they're going through something difficult in their lives right now? Any final tips? You know, I would, the first thing I would do is I would say, you know, press into the Lord, you know, really, really press in, really lean in, get your scripture, and then reach out for an earthly counselor or reach out to friends. You know, um, you're not alone. You're never, ever alone. There is somebody probably right next door to you who could be struggling just like you are. And I think in this world, we are so overwhelmed with the nonsense and the fighting and the weird things that go on and the just the busyness that we tend to get overwhelmed and we don't take care of ourselves. If you're feeling suicidal, if you are feeling depressed or anxious, if you're struggling with PTSD, I encourage you to go and reach out to someone, you know, press into the scripture, go to your doctor, go to a counselor, go to a neighbor. You are not alone. There are so many people that want to love on you and love you on your terms. Like sometimes I have trouble hugging. Don't hug me. I'll tell you, don't hug me. (laughs) And but there are so many people that will love you and will assist you on your own terms. And, and if, you, if you, you can find them online, you know, just don't sit alone and suffer. Don't do it. You deserve joy. Ooh, beautiful. You deserve joy. And you do. Yes, yes. And, and you can find it and, and cling to that hope that you will feel joy again. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's okay. You can do it. And it's okay to feel joy again, even after you've had difficult circumstances like this. It is okay. Yes. Give yourself permission. Like Rebecca said, give yourself permission. You are worthy of joy. Yes, absolutely. That is awesome. Thank you so much. Um, if people have been motivated and feel just real connection with you and your story is there a way they can reach out and contact you sure they can get us on we have a uh website it's www.warryr.org and that's the autumn's reride page on the internet and there's a place where you can call or um email um, we also have a Facebook page, and that's Autumn's Rewrite Youth Ranch. And they can also uh, message me through my Facebook page, Rebecca Christians. And um, I'd be glad to talk to them or, or, or try to steer them in the right direction or just whatever. Awesome. We will have links to all this on the show notes page. 
Oh, this is fantastic. Rebecca, you have been so generous in sharing your story of hope and giving us amazing tips of how you've been able to process this healing with God's help. I love the scriptures that you've shared and the continual way you have, I guess, leaned into the Lord. I think that is fantastic. And and really, that is the only way we make it through our hard times, folks. None of us are perfect. None of us are strong enough to do it on our own. We're just not. And isn't it great to know that we have our Jesus, who we can lean on, and yes. who, who is strong enough for the both of us, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> for all absolutely. Of us. <laughs> we are so thankful to know that, that we aren't alone, and you never are, even in your darkest moments. So, Rebecca, any final thoughts? I could have a million thoughts, but I just want you to know that I love you and that I'm so grateful for this opportunity. And just, you know, I just want to encourage people. There is there is hope. Always, always hope and seek joy. Awesome. Thank you. Great parting words. Thanks for joining us on today's episode, guys. Hope on and remember, God loves you. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. I know that there are many of you out there that are going through a hard time, and I hope you found things that have been useful today as you listen to the podcast. If you would like to access the show notes from today's podcast, visit my website. It is storiesofhopepodcast.com. That is where you'll find favorite quotes from today's episode and shareable memes. And those are fun because you can share them with your friends on social media. You will also find the links mentioned throughout today's episode, so you don't have to remember what those were. And also all the tips that were shared. Sometimes tips are shared so much throughout an episode, you forget what were those great things. So go to the show notes, storiesofhopepodcast.com to look up these fantastic resources. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode, perhaps that means that you should share this with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a tip that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this episode with them. May God bless you, especially if you are struggling with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going when things get tough. Remember to walk with Christ and he will help bear that burden. Above all else, Remember, God loves you.